The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, everybody. Um, it's Laura Goslin from DQ. Um, thanks so much for joining today's webinar on Android mobile accessibility. We're going to get started um, a couple minutes after 2 p.m. just to let everybody um, get settled and get on the webinar. And then we'll take care of some housekeeping and then go from there. Hey everyone, thanks for logging on. Um, it's now 2 p.m., but we're gonna still wait a few more minutes for those um, few people who are still logging in, um, and then we'll get started. Hey everyone, um, so it's not two minutes after 2 p.m. So we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, thanks again for joining. This is the Android mobile accessibility webinar um, being presented by our mobile accessibility guru, Christmas McMaking. I am Mark Goslin, the um, 
event manager and marketing system or a marketing assistant here at DQ. Um, so just some few housekeeping things before we get started. The captions are going to be in the chat uh, feature of GoToWebinar. So if you do need captions, please see the link um, to get those there. Um, please hold all your questions um, until the end. Um, there's a question input uh, feature on the menu item on the control panel. Um, and if you're not using that control panel, um, you can feel free to um, respond and email me your questions. and I'll make sure to read those off to Chris at the end. Um, and then please say which specific slide um, that you'll be that you're referring to with your questions so we know um, how we can properly respond to that uh, question. And then the caption link, just another note, that's also in the login email that you were previously sent. So now we're going to go ahead and get started and I'm going to turn it over to Chris. All right. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Chris McMeeking. Um, I'm a senior software uh, engineer here at DQ Systems. I'm also a member of the W3C uh, Mobile Accessibility Task Force, which is working on uh, uh, the defining what uh, WCAG 2.0 is going to be going forward. Particularly, um, I'm involved in contributing to native mobile. Uh, and I'm also uh, Chris CM on uh, Stack Overflow, very active on uh, various tags related to Android and iOS accessibility. Um, so let's get going. Um, why? There we go. All right, so uh, a quick overview. Um, when we're talking about uh, Android accessibility, um, um, the Android accessibility APIs are, are particularly simple. Um, um, they're very straightforward. Android gives you pretty, uh, pretty open ways of interacting with uh, the information delivered to assistive technologies. Um, but with that simplicity uh, comes difficulty in getting it right, knowing what things to do, uh, knowing what not to do. I think uh, when you look at the motivation behind a lot of Android's accessibility APIs, they are to be very open and provide you with a lot of flexibility. Um, along with that flexibility uh, comes the freedom to screw things up. Um, so let's talk, we're going to talk a little bit about how to um, apply WCAG 2.0 um, to, to a native Android applications. Um, about the Android accessibility ecosystem, uh, the various assistive technologies that you have to worry about more than talk back. People get that wrong a lot of time is 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 saying that inclusive uh, design is essentially talk back design and regular design. This is wrong. There's a lot of other ATs to be worried about um, and the APIs and, and things like that. Um, I'm going to do a couple of specific API demos um, in terms of staged examples. These are things that I have developed um, just so that we can talk specifically about those APIs. And then um, we're going to go through some demos from apps uh, in the wild. I think uh, those, those demos from apps in the wild, I think, are really valuable um, uh, because you can see how all of those practices uh, work out in the forms of real applications. Um, and then an advanced API demo. Um, and, and what I want to do, my goal with all of this, is to present this information uh, that provides you an overview that helps you explore on your own. It's impossible for me to fit all of the content into an hour um, to, to really prepare you to do this on your own. I want to help you think critically about the things that you come across about you, advice you come across from accessibility in the wild, because there's a lot of misleading accessibility advice out there, especially on the Android platform. So I hope to arm you with the ability to think critically um, about the other advice that you find out um, on websites and such. Um, so let's talk a little bit about WCAG uh, 2.0 and how WCAG 2.0 applies to a native Android environment. Uh, so first thing I want to point out is there is a success criteria mapping. This was put together by the Mobile Accessibility Task Force. Um, and the link for it is down here, uh, HTTPS uh, www.w3.org slash TR slash mobile accessibility mapping. Um, that is available. Um, it has a lot of great information on there. Um, but there are a few things uh, that I want to focus on that are particularly hard to, particularly easy uh, to get wrong or hard to get correct um, in an Android environment. And yes, I think those both of those statements are important. Um, focus control, um, keyboard versus gesture navigation. There's a separation in Android and any platform between accessibility focus and input focus. And uh, controlling both of these and being conscious of both of these is really important. Uh, screen orientation is important for mobile devices. Uh, touch target size, 
um, is, uh, is kind of a different concept um, when you're talking about screens that people are going to be interacting with with their fingers. Um, robustness. I think when you're talking about native Android applications and native applications in general, this robustness criteria uh, can really help you out. And basically what that means it, to me is, is, is when you're talking about name, role, and value, the name of a thing as in um, what does it do, what, what is it interacting with, the role, is it a switch, is it an edit box, is it a button, and its value, which I think is a little different um, and separate a little bit. Um, but how, how you communicate those things and how you link those things together in a way that the operating system wants you to do um, can make it much easier to maintain and, and obtain true accessibility across a multiple of devices. And we can talk more about that when it comes up, but I'm going to focus a lot on 4.1. Um, and, and in general, um, when we're talking about WCAG 2.0, if it's not HTML specific, as in like something specifically about CSS or something specific about some HTML markup, if it's not in one of those categories, it, it probably applies um, just the techniques and such that they have listed within the WCAG 2.0 documents aren't going to help you. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is this, um, this accessibility supported thing. And basically what accessibility supported from WCAG 2.0 says is you really need to make sure that you have support for common ATs and that you use um, accessible design patterns. Um, if you have like if, if your if your website or, or if your application uh, functions within a specific specific assistive technology and that technology isn't the kind of common technology that you're designing for for example like like talkback talkback is a common AT but so is switch access so is Railboard, so are these other common platforms. You have to be able to ensure that your app supports the common AT, and I can't do that does not mean conformance. Um, if you're if you're trying having trouble making an application accessible, um, and it's not conformant, um, perhaps you have to go through a redesign phase. Um, and so that's all I wanted to say about that. Everything else we're going to talk about is going to focus on the upper half of this for sure. Um, so importance of focus control. Um, let's do. Um, a quick overview of focus control. Um, it's a key aspect of most assistive technologies. Um, and just let me show you what I mean by that. Um, so when we say focus control, and um, again, I, I mentioned um, earlier that there are two aspects of focus control that we're worried about. We're not only worried about accessibility focus, but we're also worried about keyboard focus. And so what happens here is, so accessibility focus is this talkback. So I have talkback running on my device. Um, you should be able to see my Nexus 6. This is a visor window, and there's a device sitting in front of me, and I'm interacting with my device. And so accessibility focus is this green talkback rectangle that I'm swiping and pushing around. And input focus is going to be this cursor, right? And notice that the cursor up here is separate from my uh, talk back focus box and this trips developers up a lot when we're talking about managing these two focuses it can be confusing for developers when they see when they say focus something the thing that they're going to be tending to refer to is this and when they want to say something becomes focusable they're going to want to refer to this but there's actually separate focusable APIs for accessibility and that's the thing that allows this green box to be around things and that's a re there's a really valuable distinction there um, and when you're talking about things like keyboard accessibility versus talkback accessibility the ability to um, focus things versus accessibility focus them is very very important um, so essentially anything that's active anything that's editable anything that you want to be able to to do actions on needs to be focusable, not just accessibility focusable. And conversely, the opposite is true as well. We only want to be able to accessibility focus informative things. We shouldn't make them focusable. And actually, if you follow along a lot of the advice from um, from various accessibility forms is is to make something focus to make something accessibility focusable, you actually end up making it focusable, which is the wrong thing to do. Um, when you're talking about focus, I think you can connect over half of WCAG 2.0 success criterion that apply to mobile uh, can be tied directly or indirectly back to proper focus management. Um, we're going to go over that more in specific detail later. Um, but basically, anytime if you can't get proper information from things, um, especially in Android, it's frequently because you're managing focus wrong, not because the information is wrong. The only types of controls that you actually have to add additional information to are going to be your image views that are going to require content descriptions. Everything else tends to have its own information. It's just the associations and the focus control that allows us to communicate that information properly. 
Um, and finally, improper use of focus control is the easiest way to make an app just completely unusable by an assistive technology. I think the most common uh, version of that I can think is people using um, accessibility focus or input focusable to mean the opposite thing. Um, and you can do really silly things like complete, create completely inaccessibility views. For example, um, um, talk back keyboard users um, uh, are, are a really easy subgroup to just completely forget about and make an app completely broken for. Um, screen orientation. Screen orientation is another really important one. Um, you have to remember that some users are going to have devices mounted in front of them. Um, and so like, you know, you, you have a, a person confined to a wheelchair with a tablet um, mounted in front of them in like a portrait type orientation. And if your productivity application only supports landscape mode, you have made things very difficult for that particular user. You have to support landscape and portrait modes unless your content requires it. If you're developing some type of game or something that requires landscape mode, obviously that's an exception. But for your basic productivity type applications, um, you have to support um, all screen orientation modes. And I'd even go as far as to say as 360 degrees level support. Maybe, maybe that upside down portrait orientation could be ignored. Um, but absolutely, you want to make sure you support that 270 degrees of orientation. And, and there's no real surprises here. Uh, I'm not going to dig into this much more deeply than just saying that it's important um, because the APIs are, are really simple across the board. Um, so let's talk about um, uh, the mobile accessibility ecosystem a bit. Um, I already uh, showed you TalkBack. Um, sorry, my advisor uh, is freaking out over on the side here and I was getting distracted. Um, so um, I already showed you TalkBack, um, but there, there, are, there is the potential in Android, um, unlike coming from an iOS native environment, there is the potential on Android for other screen readers to exist. Um, and you have to be cognizant of that. Um, although I'm not aware of any significant market sharing third party screen readers at this point, I think it's more just the fact that third party assistive technologies can exist is something that's important to consider when you're developing applications and using the APIs. Um, switch access. Switch access is a uh, physical disability. Um, as assistive technology. Um, it allows you to scan over things, kind of like you're using um, the tab key on a keyboard, but it has a lot more fine-grained control over that scanning and includes elements for automated time scanning and things like that. That was actually a product that I started uh, about 10 years or so ago, and it became really popular, and it's awesome to see the success that Switch Access has had. Um, other uh, considerations are things like Zoom, dynamic type sizing, um, etc., um, as well as alternative input devices like keyboards and railboards. All of these are considerations that you have to take into account when designing the accessibility of your application. Um, as far as APIs go, I think this is the part that's particularly interesting about Android is the simplicity of the the basic APIs that you have example there, there are a few advanced APIs that people don't often get into, but the simplicity of the APIs as far as of an individual view within your application are really interesting and it makes things difficult to get correct. Content description, for example. Content description, I think, is a really overused property. Um, but basically, the content description allows you to off-screen text or add text to a control. In general, that's really only applicable to image views. You can, however, take it and apply a content description to a text view, um, which an assistive technology could then use as an alternate text for the view. So for example, if you were to have a text view with a, some text on it, you could override that text with a content description. Important note there though, the assistive technology does not have to respect that. So when you're doing that, um, you're essentially creating some duplicate unlinked content that may or may not be consumed. Right now, TalkBack being the primary AT that consumes that information, it's safe, but it may not be safe in the future. Um, on the contrary, label for is a very underused property, and I will go over what label for does in a bit. It's really difficult to explain. Um, important for accessibility, this is a property that I generally recommend that you leave alone unless you have a really specific purpose for that, and I will also dig into that more later. Um, here's a couple that we may or may not get to. Um, accessibility delegates allow you to attach a delegate to like a super view of things. 
um, and then have that accessibility delegate acts as like a proxy for all of the views that your layout contains. And you can do some really powerful things with this, uh, but you can also potentially get yourself into trouble. So super powerful. I hope to get into it later. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but if you don't, I've introduced you to it, please go study about it if you're interested. Um, and accessibility actions. Um, this is a new API. Um, I don't feel like the design idioms and patterns around its use are fully fleshed out, and that's something that I hope to get into um, in the Google Plus uh, live demo. Um, uh, tools, uh, a couple of the tools you have. Um, Android Device Monitor, um, I'm going to talk about specifically here shortly. Um, and then there's also um, a bunch of automated analysis solutions. DQ has one um, available. Um, Google has an automated scanning solution available. I know there are a couple others that are being worked on. Um, I don't want to talk about that too much. I want to focus on the information API, but those tools are out there. Um, so let's talk about the device monitor. Um, the device monitor is a tool that allows you to get information um, about all of those APIs that I just talked about, right? The content description and the label for attribute and all these attributes from an accessibility perspective. These are all things that the operating system does to render your visual application in a textual way that can be consumed by an assistive technology. And the device monitor is your view into that. And I've, I've taken screenshots of it here. I was gonna do a live demo of this, but it was a little clunky. Um, so basically, um, you go into Android Studio, open up Android Studio, and within the tools, there is the Android device monitor, and that's where I collected these screenshots from. And what I've done here is I've taken a snapshot, which is this little Android uh, phone guy up here. And what the UI snapshot does is it takes a screenshot and puts it alongside a textual representation of your information. And now notice I did something really specific here. And that is I took this screenshot on top of a Chrome browser. And one of the things that, that, that interests that I think is interesting is, I mean, I, I'm focusing on native mobile accessibility today, but when you're talking about the tools, when you're talking about the assistive technologies that work in a, in a native Android environment, they all work off of the same thing that the web technologies work off of. So basically you can think of a website or a hybrid application or whatever is being rendered in a web view as its native mobile components. And in fact, that's how the assistive technology, that's how TalkBack sees your application is as a native component. So when we see this, this web view here, um, this, this, uh, this div that says no tie 3.9 stars, so on and so forth, um, Android has rendered that for the AT as a android.widget.view. Uh, with a content description. Um, there's no magic here. This is just this is just Android views with content descriptions from the assistive technologies point of view. And what you can do is you can use this device monitor, whether you're building a native application or a, a hybrid app or a, or a website, you can use Android device monitor to go in, crawl through your accessibility information and see why is TalkBack having this strange behavior on my website? Oh, look, here's the accessibility information that's actually being delivered to TalkBack. This is what TalkBack's seeing. No wonder that's the problem. And at the very least, it can help you understand that. Now, from a web point of view, that may not ultimately be helpful information, but at least it can start pointing you in the right direction as to understanding why TalkBack is behaving the way that it's behaving. And hopefully that can give you some clues. And from, from a native developer's point of view, uh, the device monitor is priceless. I mean, even, even without um, the accessibility information, seeing your view hierarchy rendered, seeing all that information is really crazy useful stuff. Um, all right, so let's talk about uh, one of my uh, favorite um, accessibility APIs, important for accessibility. Um, it's really cool because it allows you to do some powerful things, um, but you can also get yourself in trouble using it uh, really quickly. So let's talk about what it does. And so basically, important for accessibility is one of the settings that you can set on a view, just like content description, just like a label for attribute. Um, auto is is just going to be set by default, and, and it's going to be um, behaving, and, and I'll actually explain what auto does when I'm done explaining the rest of these. So let's talk about no. Um, no means don't focus this view. In fact, no even means that, remember that device monitor thing that we saw when we see this hierarchy? No is going to mean that this view doesn't even show up in that interpretation for TalkBack. So in TalkBack's delivered um, an accessibility hierarchy of of your application, no means that this view would be omitted entirely. 
uh, which is really interesting. No hide descendants is essentially the same thing as no, but instead of chopping off this particular view, um, we're going to chop off an entire hierarchy of views. Um, yes uh, means um, what yes does. Yes is really interesting. So what yes is going to do is it's going to collect all of the information in children views and announce it as if they were all collected in one. And this can do really cool things and it can do really bad things. Um, the important note here is that it's only going to do that for the purely informative views. If there are any active controls within a layout, um, those views are going to be ignored and uh, interacted on separately. Now that's obviously necessary because if there are more than one active views within a layout, those views have to be indep independently focusable and independently actionable. Um, and so now let's talk about auto, right? So what auto is going to do is it's going to crawl down through your layout and look for informative things, things that have a content description, things that have actionable elements, um, and it's going to apply yes to those things, right? So if you have a content description, if you have text, or if your thing is actionable in some way, it's going to become accessibility focusable automatically, which is probably the behavior that you want most of the time. Um, but there are some cool things you can do by saying yes um, in certain circumstances. You don't want to overuse it. Uh, we'll dig into that later when we go into the live demo because uh, it's impossible to explain. Um, note that when we say important for accessibility, remember at the beginning we talked about this distinction between accessibility focus and input focus. Important for accessibility is controlling accessibility focus. Focusable is controlling input focus. Um, focusable, saying something is focusable, like view.focusable equals true, is very different from saying view.important for accessibility equals yes. View.focusable equals true is referring to keyboard focus, and as I said, it will now interpret that as being active and so will inherently become accessibility focusable, but that is not the same as just saying something is important for accessibility. They're both useful, they're both useful for accessibility, um, but they are different. Um, all right, so let's go through um, a few um, DQ pattern library demos. These are um, contrived demos that I've created essentially just for the purposes of webinar and demoing things like that um, because I had control over them, right? So uh, the first one I want to do is the control labels demo. And what I'm demoing here is the, oh, one of my layouts got corrupted. That's annoying. Uh, so what I'm demoing for you here is the label for attribute. And remember what I said was, was um, th there's a lot of ways to change the information of a view to share that name role value, right? The name of a thing is what it represents. In this case, um, we have a switch here. And notice I have, this, uh, I have this toast that pops up at the bottom of the screen here where it says the lights. That's the information that TalkBack is sharing with me. That's the announcement. And I will share that announcement when it's important. So when we're talking about name role and value of a thing, Right now, what we're talking about is this switch. And notice it says off switch. Neither of those is the name, right? We have off, we have the state. Uh, we have switch, which is the role. But we have no name for this thing, right? And one way to implement this might be to say, all right, let me give this switch a content description, the lights, right? So right now, it's announcing as off switch, right? I focus this thing as it says off switch. And so if we added a content description that said the lights, we would have off switch the lights, um, which is good. We, we've created that association, but we've A, we've added um, a localizable string that we have to keep track of. Um, and we haven't really accomplished anything really awesome, namely um, the fact that this switch is associated with this label, right? Um, and so what we want to do is instead of creating that content description on that switch, what we want to do is we want to set the lights as the label for the lights. And now notice this is reading now as off switch for the lights, right? And we've created that association. So there's the, and, and so what happens then is as we change this visible label, if we were to change this in our code, uh, we don't have to update any content description. We don't have to make sure that those two strings are pointing to the same thing, that the, that the lights text is pointing to the content description of the switch. We just say, hey, these two controls are associated with one another, which actually, um, which actually achieves even more valuable things, namely associating those two controls is inherently valuable um, because you could have an assistive technology that takes advantage of that association, right? Um, and then uh, just note, you'll notice here as a best practice, 
uh, notice that I've wrapped the, the, the touch target of this into one big blob because the information in this layout here, um, there, there's no additional information that this layout is providing. And so when you're, when you're talking about talkback users, we have some redundant information here, right? We have off switch for the lights. And then when we swipe right, we have the lights, right? And then we have that duplicate announcement. Um, and we are also touch to explore users, right? I can drag my finger around the screen and I can touch this, see this circle here where my finger's dragging. Um, if you wrap these two things together into this big focusable container for this layout, um, you've achieved both better usability for a blind talkback user and better usability for a sighted talkback user, which is really cool. Um, let's go to edit text controls. Edit text controls are really interesting. So um, essentially, we're going to see the same design pattern here. We want to do that label for attribute, um, and we want to use hints, right? So edit text box have two important accessibility properties. They have the label for attribute, and they have the hint. And so what we have here is we have really basic John edit box. That's how this edit box is announcing. And um, basically, we're missing the name, right? We have a sample of text. We have a current value, um, but we don't have a name, namely that this is the free field first name, right? When we go here, down here, when we use that, that um, hint, that temporary value to convey the information that a name should, it's very easy for us to lose that information by replacing it, by entering text, right? So I've just entered text into this box. Let me collapse my keyboard. And now, um, now it's ch edit box. We don't know that it's the first name box anymore. We've lost that very important name information, right? We need the name of the thing. It's the it's ch. It's John for first name. It's Chris for first name. And so that's what we did down here. Is we have a we have a hint and we have a label for on this John for first name. John edit box for first name. That's the full announcement. Um, and so when you when you have your edit text controls, make sure you're using both of those properties, the hint and the label for attribute. In fact, the label for attribute is really the only way on edit boxes to cr uh, create all of that uh, proper accessibility information. And nested elements, that's the last one I wanna do. Although I'm, I'm running a little behind, so I think actually I'm gonna talk about nested accessibility elements within the terms of uh, the app that I wanted to demo. So, so let me let me skip that one, and and we'll get to it in the in the form of the the demo, which real world examples. All right. So let me talk to you about a design pattern um, that I have seen pop up, um, and and Google Google does this in their Google Plus, and it does some good things and it does some bad things, but I think it's a really interesting design pattern um, because of the the things that it's attempting to do um, and the different APIs that it's using. So remember at the beginning of the thing when I was talking about important for accessibility, one of the things I said you could do is, is collect information together. You can wrap information together using that important for accessibility equals yes. And if you hide the right things, you can do things like take um, this big view of information here and collect them all into one accessible blob. Um, and so what, what the, the information here in the readout, so we have Manju Maviden, 20 hours ago, deliciously decadent melt in your mouth food, impress your guests, uh, a long announcement of all of the information that's collected here. Um, and then showing out of 13. And then if we had allowed that announcement to continue, which it takes forever, um, afterwards you will see that there are a bunch of actions that you can perform on this box, right? So if we hit enter, we'll see a list of accessibility actions. And so now we can see all of the things that we can do on this post. Um, and this is both a good and a bad design pattern. It's good from the sense that when we're talking about a blind talkback user, um, it has accomplished some really good things, right? This, this collecting of all of this information, and, and there's no doubt over um, when we say the plus ones here, there's no doubt over how many plus ones, these 82 plus ones, there's no doubt over what posts those 82 plus ones belong to. And there's no doubt over who we're gonna be commenting, and there's no doubt over what posts you're gonna be sharing when you have this kind of streamlined accessibility action, all of this information wrapped together. That being said, this information is very difficult to consume. Um, and it's very difficult um, for, so, so let's, let's talk about those other assistive 
technologies, those other users that we're worried about, right? Because you got to remember, we're not just worried about blind talkback users, uh, but we're worried about talkback users. And I haven't even started talking about switch access and Brailleboard users yet, right? Let's just talk about what this does to talkback. And the first thing that it does is notice that I'm using this touch to explore thing that I talked about, right? And right now, there is one touch target on my screen, and that's really kind of not very usable, right? Because because when when you look at this as a sighted user. How many touch targets are on this screen? I can count at least, and I'm ignoring this global menu, by the way. Um, I count a touch target here, a touch target here, a touch target here. There's four individually focusable things here. Um, and so as a sighted talkback user, first, I'm frustrated that I can't interact with these, right? So I, I'm moving my finger down here. I'm trying to focus this comment button, but I can't do it. Um, and, and that in itself is an accessibility violation. Now, honest, now, now I could go in here and I could do this and I could go in and I could comment and I would figure that out, right? But when you're, when you're looking at the information um, and, and thinking about, now let's talk again about blind talkback users, think about the structure that having those separate controls conveyed is. And, and actually, let's talk about that, the structural part of this in terms of a braille board user, right? So, so let's look at this in the eyes of, a braille board user. So we have this, this post, and this is a different post because I was putting this together a couple days ago, but, but we have this, this red rectangle around this post, and this is the current focusable blob, right? And when we look at this information in the eyes of a braille board user, this is a lot of text to consume. And, and I purposely picked a, a kind of concise thing, right? We only have a few words here. And, and this is, this is um, it's difficult to consume, right? That's a lot of braille. Um, and, and I would argue that, that when we're talking about someone, a power user, when we're talking about someone familiar with Google Plus coming back to your application, I would argue that the, the pieces of information at the end, the plus one to the shares, the, the comment on this, all those actionable controls, um, I would argue that those are actually the most important pieces of information, and they're going to be hidden at the end of this long stretch of Braille, right? And, and so what we've done is we've, we've taken this one consumable blob of information and yeah we've done this association which is great for blind talkback users but we've taken a lot away from other users namely braille board users sighted talkback users um so on and so forth and so let me show you what i think the proper way the proper design idiom for this is um and and let's look at it this way right so i have these red and blue rectangles around the things that i think should be focusable um, independently by talkback. And I think what, what I'm trying to do with this is say, so so here, right, we have this, this red rectangle around the parts of this post that are informative, right? So, so when, we, when we see this picture, this picture provides no additional information to a blind user um, than in suspension and waiting and perhaps a content description on that picture does. But all of this is informative. It can all be grouped together really nicely and, and someone who, who wants to listen to those, a, a talkback user waiting for that feedback probably doesn't mind waiting for that information. But then when we look at these things that I've separated out here, these blue rectangles, how you can indep independently focus the plus one, how you can independently focus the comments, how you can independently focus the shares, um, not only is that more usable uh, from a multitude of AT users' perspectives, but I would also argue that it conveys structure, right? Take a look at the Braille here, how we have this, this one long informative piece of Braille, and then these three individual focusable things. Just the fact that those are independently focusable conveys some meaning and conveys some structure. And I think that that is super important. You know, like, 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 look at this, look at this blob of Braille down here at the bottom. And then look at this and, and tell me that there isn't information lost when you put all of that stuff together. There's definitely some information loss in just the structure of that thing. Uh, not only that, but you can accomplish that association. I've already showed you how to accomplish that association with the label four attribute, right? That's the thing that we gain by wrapping all of these together. 
is is we say, all right, this plus one is associated with this post, and these comments are associated with this post, and the share is associated with this post. We can accomplish that just as easily with use of the label four attribute, with use of a content description associating it with uh, Francois de Lugia or or the title of this post or something like that. Th those those associations can be created in better, simpler ways. Um, so uh, last thing I want to talk about is the accessibility delegate, um, and then I'm going to open things up for questions. Um, so when we're talking about um, accessibility delegate, what basically what the accessibility delegate allows us to do is to take um, to a root view, we can set the accessibility delegate, and that will act as a delegate of information, as a delegate for accessibility events for all of the contained child events. One of the, one of the uh, common problems that I see um, on Android, for example, is, is um, switches. When you have a switch control with the word like off or the word on on it. Um, if it's all in capital letters, there are certain versions of the text-to-speech engine that Android interacts with that will change the text OF, capital O, capital F, capital F, to announcing that individually. So instead of uh, TalkBack announcing it as off, it'll read it as OFF, which is annoying for something that you come across in an application an awful lot of times, right? And so how can we fix that problem? Well, first we could go through and change the on and off text to all from all of our switches in all of the applications that we have to at capital O, cap, lowercase n, capital O, lowercase f, lowercase f. We could do that on all of our switches. That's obnoxious. Why don't we instead take advantage of accessibility delegates? And so what we do is on the root view of all of our activities, just attach this simple delegate. What we're going to say is um, on request send accessibility event, um, if the event type is a newly accessibility focused view, and the text is capital OFF or capital ON, we're going to set the event text to the lowercase version of that text. And so what we've just done is really simply on all of the views in our application, uh, we have said a in all capitals OFF and in all capitals ON is the lowercase variant. So we've just fixed all of those accessibility violations or accessibility, I guess, best practices. We've, all, we've fixed all of those um, with just a few lines of code on our accessibility delegate rather than having to track down all of the individual switches in our application, which is an annoying and exhausting process. Um, uh, with that, um, I want to um, invite any questions. Um, I would love to sit here and chat questions for a while. Thanks for listening. Um, I am super active on Stack Overflow. Anything that can be answered within the, the scope of a Stack Overflow question, I'd be happy to address. Um, if you tag them with uh, accessibility Android, especially TalkBack, um, I will guaranteed read it. Um, and also um, working on the native mobile DQ blog, the, the marketing folks here came up with what I think is just an awesome idea of, of sharing um, content videos. And I'm going to be working on that. In fact, the, the demo that I gave here regarding Google Plus and the problems that I have with that design pattern, um, I, I just did a video the other day digging into that um, in even more detail. Um, and there will be a blog post coming out on that shortly. Um, and with that, um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, Chris, we got one here from Mary Elizabeth. Uh, she asks, so is view.focusable um, is more about input cursor. Um, she might have missed that at the beginning. Could you answer that question for her? Yes. All right. So input focusable, input focusable. So what we're talking about is this di distinction between input focus and accessibility focus. And let me bring up my visor again. Um, so input focus, um, strictly speaking, input focus doesn't mean anything super specific for a whole lot of controls. You're, you're right in that. Um, so, so for example, right now, I have a, a control that is input focusable and one control, one control that has input focus and one control that has accessibility focus. That being said, it is not input focus is not confined to um, is not confined to 
edit text controls. Um, it actually has more to do with keyboard focus. So um, controls that can quote, um, receive input focus are basically things that when you're hitting the tab board on like a Bluetooth keyboard, um, those are the things that would receive keyboard focus um, and not necessarily, and then also by default are then also accessibility focusable. Um, I think the thing where where uh, the distinction where, where so so there are controls where you would want to have input focus and accessibility focus, which are going to be things like buttons, um, edit text boxes, anything that's going to be actionable is going to be quote focusable because you have to be able to focus it with a keyboard in order to have it be actionable, right? So, so to tab onto it and hit enter, that's what quote focusable means. Accessibility focusable just means text boxes and things like that. And I, I can't really think of a time when you would want to have just input focusable and not accessibility focusable. And I don't even know that the operating system would allow that. Great. So we have another one here from Morali. Um, he's asking, uh, he says, voice assistant is another common screen reader we see on Samsung devices. Uh, is it required to test uh, using both voice assistant and talkback? Um, that is an interesting question. Um, there, there are, so, so when you're talking about that, that's actually a really deep API question. Um, and, and I think, but the answer, the answer for me is um, you could certainly have usability violations in voice assistant if you did not test for that individually. But I think when you're talking about um, is it generically accessible, I think um, TalkBack is going to cover all of those issues. Um, and so I would say it, it depends on what your motivation is. If you wanted to create a really good voice assistant experience, I would absolutely recommend testing with that. That being said, the TalkBack assistive technology is going to cover all of the properties that voice assistant cares about and more. Um, the thing that I would recommend is testing with TalkBack and switch access. I think um, if you cover those two assistive technologies, basically what you're looking at is a talkback is an assistive technology that cares about the information, that cares about the associations, and then switch access would be that that um, assistive technology that cares about what things are actionable and can I interact with them. And I think when you're when you're talking about covering a, a lot of accessibility information with minimal effort, switch access and talkback are the two ATs that I would recommend testing with from an accessibility standpoint. Now, obviously, if you want a good voiceover uh, or um, voice interaction experience, um, you're gonna have to test with that individually. There's there's no inherent benefit, just it would, it would be capable, it would be possible for a user of that AT to work the application and get through everything if you can also get through it with talkback and switch access. Great. So another one here from Janos. Uh, he or she asks, um, can hybrid apps take advantage of the APIs? Oh, that depends on your hybrid app engine. Ultimately, I believe most of the hybrid app engines that I'm aware of are only going to be able to take advantage of the APIs uh, through the context of their HTML and web view rendering. Uh, so, so for example, you're not going to be able to interact with the views individually on the, that accessibility delegate thing, right? Um, you could probably use an accessibility delegate on the root wrapping container of a hybrid application and still achieve the same things with that accessibility delegate, but anything outside of that accessibility delegate technique, any of the, the things that we talked about, those specific APIs for the specific views, all of that information is going to have to be manipulated through the HTML content or whatever, or JavaScript content or whatever language that they have. And, and if those APIs and whatever um, wrapper they have around that hybrid thing, um, would be in charge of managing that information, whether you're editing the HTML directly or through some scripting language that they give you access to, um, you're not going to have direct access to those APIs, only access through the browser or web view, whatever rendering your hybrid engine has created for you. Okay, we have another one here. Um, for an Android list box, uh, they're facing issues with accessibility focus not following the input focus when used with a physical keyboard. Um, how can this be resolved? 
<laughs> that is a super specific question um, that um, I would have to dig into and see uh, if, if, if they can send a minimalistic example that I could play around in. Um, I'm sure there, there is a solution. Um, my concern might be that the list box that Android, that the native component that they're relying on is in itself not accessible and that they may have to create a custom component to do it. Um, I'm not saying that that's the answer. I haven't played around with those uh, recent enough to know, you know, based on the new version of Android that just came out and all of that stuff. There's there's a lot of super specific concerns there. What version of the uh, Android compatibility library are you relying on? Um, I'm just not comfortable giving an on the fly answer to that question because it's so specific. But if I were to get like a GIST or even the control with all of the versions that I talked about, um, I'd be happy to address that specifically. It's not a super long answer. It's just not one I can give off the top of my head. Got it. So we have another one here from Felicia. Um, they ask, uh, can you give any tips on working and testing on PhoneGap, which is not native, but emulates native attributes? Yes, uh, PhoneGap um, is a tricky one to handle accessibility from. I will definitely give you that. Um, it's kind of one of those uh, one of those um, worst of both world answers as far as simplicity of implementing a native application versus the the limited functionality of a hybrid app. It kind of tries to ties those two together, which from a standard user experience, I think um, creates a pretty good user experience from an accessibility point of view. It's a it's a pain in the butt because you are reliant on them supporting the native API that you have available. And so what ends up happening is you end up tempted to want to use bad practices in order to facilitate accessibility. And so what I'd say as far as understanding what's happening, um, and um, and even then you're, you're, you're only gonna get part of the way there with that. Why is my, why is this suddenly so broken? Present. Sorry, resetting my presentation, there we go. But um, what I will draw your attention to is the device monitor. The, the cool thing about the device monitor, um, like I said when I was talking about it, is basically we're looking at the rendering, uh, the, the assistive technology textual rendering of your application. And this is gonna be useful regardless of the type of application that you're working with. So when you're talking about debugging why something is happening, you can always rely on the device monitor um, to see what that information is. And so for example, oops, didn't wanna do that. Uh, for example, seeing the content description, seeing uh, whether something is focusable, um, seeing whether something is long pickable or scrollable, all of these properties are gonna be helpful. The question then becomes, does PhoneGap, do the PhoneGap APIs allow me to manipulate the native property that I need to manipulate? And that is a very PhoneGap specific concern. Um, and I personally haven't uh, done a whole lot of work with PhoneGap, but that's going to be dependent on your situation and the information that you get from the device monitor. But definitely, definitely use the device monitor as part of your debugging process for accessibility in a PhoneGap application. Great. Um, so we have another question here asking if you could recommend an Android simulator for testing. Uh, I, I mean, the, the improvements that they made when you're talking about uh, uh, simulators, um, the, the improvements they've made to, um, with, uh, with the Hexam and, and each one of these are getting rid of, but really just the stock, the stock simulators are, are working pretty good. Um, my setup for all of this is um, I use Nexus, I, use a, I always use the, the, the high DPI ones. I don't really find a whole lot of um, use in, in uh, limiting the um, DPI as far as graphics performance goes. Um, um, lots of memory, uh, lots of uh, RAM size, all that stuff. And then the other thing I will say is there's a subset of open source applications that you should download. Um, in order to facilitate this. Um, so one of the things that I think developers don't realize is that you can actually get talkback onto your simulated devices, and that makes things uh, much, much easier for you. So let me go to github.com, I think, um, uh, talkback should be, yeah, talkback, here you go, yeah. So, so download talkback, um, 
uh, the, the Google Talkback open source repository, they don't actually use it as far as uh, the, you know, the kind of pull request open source workflow kind of thing, but they do push commits to it when they have new releases. Um, and I also have some commits on my own fork that I have because their project setup isn't quite right. Um, but I have some, that they will push new stuff to this um, frequently. Um, basically, if they, if they have a new release of Talkback, they'll push that release out um, and it gives you access to that on emulators, which is really, really cool. Um, the thing I would say about emulators is if you're talking about using emulators to test different versions of Android, um, and, and that, that there are specifically important versions of Android to focus on, um, the ones that really matter are the ones that really change the way the APIs work. And for that, I would say 4.2, if you're, if you're going back and going for deep support, 4.2, the difference between 4.2 and 4.4 is very important. The difference between 4.4 and 5.0 is very important. And there aren't really any super important differences um, up until the most recent stuff. So if, you're, so if you're talking about testing to cover all of the different accessibility API functionality, I would say you should test on a 4.2 device, a 5.0 device, and a recent device and you have gotten really, really good test coverage of your accessibility information coming from your application. Great, so we have another one here. Um, the current talkback does not announce the heading level. Would you recommend adding a trait slash hint suggesting the heading level or would feature talkback, um, will they start render rendering the heading level as well? <laughs> uh, I would not recommend adding anything um the support for that um in future versions is highly questionable um but yeah the the that that is a user agent issue um heading level um has has questionable value in general i think the fact that it announced things as headings which is something that android improved recently um is important but but i think headings for me from an accessibility point of view as far as they're being announced as a heading um, are more important from a navigation landmark perspective um, and I believe uh, the current version of accessibility of TalkBack uh, supports headings as navigation landmarks, which I think is, is probably more important than the level. And not only that, but if you start adding level to things, uh, you get into a, a confusing muck of, of uh, accessible things in some versions and inaccessible things in other versions. And um, ultimately, that particular issue is is Android specific, and in fact, actually, uh, probably the Chrome browser that's not properly reporting that information. And it's a known user agent issue. It's a popular user agent issue. Everybody's frustrated by it. I imagine in the future it will be fixed, um, but I am not an Android rep. I just talk to them a lot. Great. Uh, another one here. Uh, do you have any good resources for Android built-in switch access? Um, especially that address text entry. Uh, I'm not sure what um, they, they are asking for as far as resources go, as far as resources and how to use, or as far as resources in what it does. Um, um, Switch Access was a project that I started initially on iOS about 10 years ago that just went crazy and happened to get adopted into a lot of ecosystems. So I personally have a ton of knowledge um, on the best practices and stuff within there. Um, but I'm not sure when, when she's, when, when the, when the, the question is posted, I'm not sure what kind of information is being looked for. So if you, you could ask that question again, more specifically, um, that would be great. Okay, great. Uh, another one here that is pretty good. Um, what's the best way to check color contrast, um, when you're testing your native mobile apps? Um, so the, there's two good ways to do it. Um, uh, to be honest, um, automated, um, automated is the way to go. I know, um, the, the Google scanner has an auto, has a color contrast tool. Check, check in it. I haven't had the best luck with it. It does work. It throws a lot of false positives. Um, our, a test, um, product has a, a test is our autom DQ's automated scanning solution. Uh, we have a color contrast check built in. Um, I don't have the demo for it on my current version, but we have a color contrast tool. If you're talking about wanting to do it outside of automated testing, um, what I would do 
is create one of those emulators that we talked about. I just exited out of it, but let's pretend that this is an emulator. And I specifically say emulator. Don't do this within Visor. Visor mucks with um, how your colors get rendered. So please make sure that you're using an emulator and not a screencasted device because that's not going to work. But basically, this is an emulator here. Pretend like this is an emulator. Download the color contrast analyzer tool of your choice which is going to be something that looks like this. Uh, grab the colors. Make sure, now notice here, and, and when, I, when I said automated tools and, and how um, Google's, Google's um, accessible color contrast checker um, through some false positives, um, when you're talking about how you check for color contrast, it's really important where you get this color. Notice when I zoom in here, how this text is rendered is not consistent. It's all not just one white blob. There's some shadowing there that creates a 3D effect, right? And so it's, it's really difficult to have an automated color contrast um, check that is going to catch all of the issues and not throw false positives. And so it's a balance there. So it's not like the Google color contrast check is doing anything wrong. It's just you, you can see even right here that even, even on the internal line of this B, that these whites are rendered differently, right? And so what I always do with my color contrast analysis is I give the developer the benefit of the doubt. I try and pick the pixel that, that is A, reasonably prevalent, but also that contrasts well, um, and then go in here and select the background color. So so we were we, we, we were on the B, right? So let's pick this purple one and all of those colors pass except for the um, AAA small text requirement, which there are there are very few there are very few times you're gonna get four check marks in this box on a gradient type of background. But that is how you would do color contrast check. Um, again remember that this needs to be an emulator later, not a screencasted device. The, the, the screencasting device itself corrupts that color rendering. The emulator is going to be the best way to do this. Or, like I said, one of those automated tools of your choice. Okay, we'll do one final question here because we have a few minutes left. Um, so, can you talk about your experience with accessibility focus management in native apps? Um, for example, when moving from view to view, when moving in and out of dynamic um, user interface, et cetera, do things work pretty well out of the box or would there be a lot of meaningful sequence issues with the default experience? Oh, that is a really crazy good question. In fact, let me bring up, let me bring up uh, an emulator real quick. Um, and I will warn you that the answer to this is going to go over time a little bit, um, but that is a really good question. So, so while my emulator is spinning up, let me start off by saying that I think in general, when you're talking about talkback focus control, when you're talking about accessibility focus control, that accessibility focus control is in general um, spot on automatically by default. It does the right thing. And you should probably just leave it alone, even when it's wrong, unless it's wrong in a really, really breaking way, you should probably just leave it alone. Um, because the, the fixes for that are going to be things that end up um, breaking things for various versions of things. Like, like it might not work really good for you in your current setup in your current version, but when you start mucking around with where focus goes using the APIs, outside of perhaps the exception of putting focus somewhere to begin with, you know, like saying, all right, when I open this view, I want focus to be here instead of the default place. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, call that an exception to this statement outside of that mucking with how focus works. Um, ends up that the APIs just don't support management of accessibility focus like that very well. You're going to end up with a lot of weird race conditions. Um, you're going to end up with um, accessibility delegates doing things that accessibility delegates really shouldn't do. Um, and you're going to do all that and not accomplish a whole lot of value. And most of the time, you're just going to end up making things worse, unpredictable, and potentially breaking things for other assistive technologies outside of time. That being said, when we're talking about input focus, there's a really important demo. Um, so let me show you some, some interesting input focus issues that you can run if you just let the Android operating system do things the way the Android operating system wants to do. Oh no, I don't have talk. This is a disaster. 
Um, yeah. These don't take super long to spin up. Um, so let's take a peek here at, uh, so, so what just happened was, um, I, oh, wow, that's, oh, okay, I guess I'll just have to, so TalkBack is speaking in my ear right now. All right, so I have TalkBack on this device, right? So I have TalkBack running, and I can use my keyboard, so I'm using the arrow keys right now. I'm arrowing up and down, and I can um, use things. So I just hit up, I just hit down, I'm not using my mouse, right? I'm going to go into TalkBack, and I am going to use the arrow keys. Oh, come back there. There we go. All right. So I'm using my arrow keys to navigate around this view. All right. So I'm hitting down, and it's not going anywhere. I'm hitting up, and TalkBack Focus isn't going anywhere. Notice that there is a settings button up here that keyboard control can – I can't use my keyboard to change the settings of TalkBack. So for a for a um, for a TalkBack keyboard user, the TalkBack settings are completely inaccessible. That's not very good. <laughs> um, and so when you're talking about, like I said, when you're talking about accessibility focus, as in my ability to do to swipe right and left across the screen, the default handling is perfect. When we're talking about input focus, as in um, my ability to use the keyboard to focus settings, um, they have screwed up. And, and remember, throughout the presentation, I was, I was really important and really distinctive about the difference between accessibility focus and input focus. This thing is accessibility focusable, but it's not input focusable. And that is not good. This is an input control. This is interactionable. This is something that a keyboard user should be able to interact with. You know, a, a talkback, a blind keyboard talkback user is a really common um, inclusive design thing to support. And um, just by the fact that this thing is not input focusable, um, support for that um, is broken. Um, and so that I think is the important part of that is is making sure that the ordering for input focus is correct. Um, so basically, um, test it with a keyboard. If, if it's working for a keyboard, if it's working for a blind talkback user, if it's working in switch access, um, those three things together um, should create a really good generic inclusive design picture. Great, so um, that's all the time we have. Thanks everyone for hopping on this webinar. We'll be sending a follow-up email with the presentation materials. Uh, be sure to check out uh, Chris's upcoming webinar on iOS mobile um, accessibility, uh, native mobile accessibility best practices. That'll be on Tuesday, October 10th at the same time. Thanks so much.